much uh, for that, um, uh, Orla. Uh, welcome to everybody. Very happy to see you all here. Uh, also wishing to say that we are recording the session so that we can also, uh, the people who could not join for whatever reason now can still see it later because we are very happy to have an introduction uh, from Robert. Um, and I think also Bika is joining us from Vietnam, but we will see uh, about that later. Um, uh, we have we had a team from Wageningen visiting Vietnam. They just came back last night. That could also be a reason why it was a bit tight to get everything lined up just before Christmas. Uh, but without further ado, we uh, like to hear from uh, Robert and then uh, please keep your questions. You may put them in the chat uh, so that we can uh, answer them afterwards. Uh, and also we can have some more discussion afterwards. Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So my name is Robert van Loo. I work at uh, Plant Breeding uh, uh, in Wageningen University and Research. I'm the research group leader of a group working on abiotic stress tolerance in uh, different crops, uh, potato, tomato, uh, barley, but also quinoa. And quinoa is in uh, my heart already for many years. And one of the reasons is uh, that it is an enormously high uh, salt tolerance. So that's also the reason for this talk and the developments that we have together with uh, Dr. Bika. Um, I couldn't join the uh, mission to Vietnam last uh, week, but I was there in November when we gave a NAFIC uh, training course uh, with uh, people from seven universities in Vietnam, also talking about quinoa. And there's also where I met Dr. Bika and uh, we are working together with her to see how we can uh, do feasibility studies in the Mekong Delta. So today I want to show you what the crop is, uh, some results on, on uh, high salinity uh, conditions, and uh, also a little bit about uh, uh, the situation in the Mekong Delta, where we think that uh, quinoa could be a, a great opportunity to provide uh, food security and income to farmers. But, uh, Okay, that as an introduction. On the, this slide you see uh, a field uh, of quinoa in Europe and a very famous person also in there, which is a person in France that helped us to uh, start commercialization of quinoa in uh, Europe of our own varieties. And I will show uh, also a little bit more on that. But, uh, <coughs> Before I forget, I should give some acknowledgement to people that we are working with and that Bika is one, uh, Dr. Long at Hanoi uh, Vietnam National Agriculture University, but we also work together with uh, a company, a startup company in Wageningen called Radical Crops, where also uh, a former PhD student of us uh, works now that worked on salt tolerance in quinoa and Matthijs Peters, uh, an MSc graduate that now is doing a PhD in uh, quinoa. So, those are also very important in this uh, field. Jason Abbott is the person in France who started up the uh, commercial use of our varieties in Europe. And of course, many colleagues at Plant Breeding. A further uh, work has been supported by top sector uh, from the Netherlands, uh, the knowledge based pro uh, project uh, that also uh, is linked to, to these Delta talks, uh, knowledge. Uh, Base program 35, and then the project Deltas under pressure, and uh, NAFIC, also the uh, organization uh, that supports international collaboration in education uh, by the universities, uh, Netherlands new universities. So we developed Quinoa for Europe. Of course, it doesn't come from Europe, it comes from South America. Uh, and there it's grown in the high Andes, um, and it's also grown in southern Chile, for example, so very different latitudes. And uh, yeah, we started to develop quinoa as one of the new crops that could be the fourth crop or could be used in crop diversity in Europe. Uh, and uh, that that uh, is now uh, a business uh, that is going from, let's say, 5,000 hectares, slowly moving to 10,000 hectares in Europe. It's not that big yet, but it's commercially viable. And uh, one of the reasons uh, was also that we have been breeding 
uh, day length adapted or long uh, latitude uh, what is it latitude uh, adapted varieties that grow and mature well on the European conditions from Spain to Denmark even. Uh, but we also want to see really now how we can make use of this trait of quinoa that it is so enormously salt tolerant. Initially, you think, hey, let's not do that. It's so difficult under saline conditions. Uh, so we started up production in Europe under non-saline saline conditions. But now we want to see how we can really get this trait of quinoa going. Here you see Jason Abbott and me at the segregating population of quinoa. We started crossing and breeding and inbreeding and made a, a whole set of varieties that are now being used in Europe and are also now being tested in Vietnam. Uh, so a little bit about what quinoa is. And first thing to know, it, it has minor yield loss up to 10 ds per meter, which is an enormously high salinity level. And I think that most of you might know, but this is about 20% of seawater. So most crops really uh, wilt and die and, and don't produce anything. And certainly I don't know any food crops that can do this. The potential quinoa grain yield, as we see it also in Chile, for example, is up to five ton per hectare in commercial production. It's really not the standard production, but it's what's possible. That's under good conditions. Uh, we don't see any leaf damage up to 50 ds per meter, which is seawater level. If you build it up gradually, it stays green. Seed doesn't fall out, whatever. It doesn't grow anymore then, but it doesn't die. So if you have a drying out situation in soils that have an initially rather low salinity level. It will increase a lot when the water runs out. Quinoa will not die from that. Standard farm yields in Europe are between two and three and a half tons per hectare. So certainly not that enormously good figure that we see in Chile. But in Chile, standard yields are between four and five tons per hectare. Now, the grain yield of most solar and time uh, lines at 20 ds per meter is still above two hectares, two tons per hectare, which is enormously high. No other food crop can do this, I think. Uh, and quinoa can therefore be a staple food crop in salinity affected areas. Of course, people don't know how to use quinoa, maybe. Uh, so what is now this is what the crop looks like. Uh, it's uh, a main stem most of the time with a head in which the seeds are. It can branch uh, to compensate if there are uh, sort of low densities in the field or when you want to use low density seed cropping. It uh, has very small seeds. Uh, and I'm stuck now. Uh, it doesn't react to my page down. Ah, there we are. Rather amazing. The, is this? Yeah, we are. Okay. Uh, next one is this. This is how quinoa grows in uh, Europe. Uh, you can see it clearly is a, an arable crop, sometimes higher, sometimes lower in, in plant height, but you can always use uh, combined harvesting or other. Uh, um, uh, forms of harvesting with spotting, for example. Here on the right, you see uh, how small the seeds are, but uh, you can get very high yields still. Uh, now, why is quinoa interesting as a food? I think in the 80% uh, uh, 88% dry matter, you find quite a high percentage of protein. Uh, there is a little bit of plant oil there. There is starch, but it's less than in cereals, and it has a good set of essential amino acids. I will show a little bit later. There are minerals there, uh, a lot of iron, for example, dietary fiber. One of the interesting things is there are no gluten. Of course, rice also has no gluten, uh, but compared to rice, uh, the protein content is much better. And yeah, uh, it's healthy, but I think that most importantly, it's also tasty. Uh, it could easily replace rice in recipes. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, it has this very high salt tolerance and low wilting point, which is associated to some extent, because if you get a high salt concentration in the soil water, the uh, water potential is also very, very negative uh, and can be up to minus 40, for example, 30. And then that will be about the point where, you know, it starts wilting. Um, the crop cycle can be very variable depending on the variety. 
three to seven months. So that is one of the things that needs to be yeah, uh, tested. What is the best uh, crop cycle length? Uh, so the variety selection for a certain region is very important. It can mature, grow and mature under various day length uh, situations. The high Andes materials in Bolivia, Peru, Ecuador need 12 hour day length. The southern Chile uh, materials and also the materials that we have developed for Europe uh, will be very, very quick, normally at 12 hours. So they will be too short to crop cycle. They need day lengths of 14 to uh, even up to 20 hours uh, a day. Uh, and we also have to select, therefore, and develop maybe even the right varieties for areas like the Mekong Delta, where day length is usually close to 12 hours. Now, this is one of the things why I think that quinoa might also be interesting, not only for its salt tolerance, um, much better than rice could do, but also because the nutritional quality is good. In terms of energy, it's the sound the, about the same, but in protein, it's much more. Uh, there is a little bit more fat there, uh, which is uh, healthy plant oils. Uh, there are minerals in there, starch is somewhat less, and fiber is better. And the protein quality is also pretty, pretty good. So interestingly, if you take 100 gram of product of uh, quinoa, then uh, you will uh, have 15 grams of protein. If you take 100 gram of chicken, fresh chicken, of course, uh, so non cooked, uh, that will be 20 grams of protein. So it's actually close to a meat product in that sense. And if you look at a lot, a lot of meat replaces, uh, then they usually get about 15 grams of protein. So quinoa already has that on its own with uncooked quinoa. Uh, amino acid quality is very good. All the essential amino acids are there and they are there in greater amounts than uh, in rice. Uh, as a, and and uh, some of them are better than uh, legumes. Uh, there's certainly a better amino acid composition in terms of essential amino acids compared to wheat, for example. Here it's about the amounts, not um, uh, so because the protein content is higher in quinoa you know, than in rice. Of course, uh, the amino acid concentrations themselves are also higher. But you can see there's a lot of lysine, so that's a very important essential amino acid. <clears throat> uh, if you look at the mineral composition, you can see it, it also has much more minerals than, uh, for example, white rice, but, uh, especially iron. Uh, that, then something about yield levels. Uh, you can get these uh, very nice high yields consistently in, in Chile, but that's a very good cultivation area and uh, they've optimized their quinoa production system enormously. In the Netherlands, on the conventional farming, we are in between two and two, uh, 20, uh, 2,000 and 2,800 kilos per hectare uh, with the existing varieties. Today, we have some new varieties that, that uh, are even outperforming this. Uh, I will come to that also later. Uh, we have developed an F1 hybrid seed production system and, and have uh, a set of experimental F1 hybrids that outperform standard varieties, uh, inbred line varieties uh, by 20, 30, 40 percent even. So that we have consistent yields now with these F1 hybrids of three and a half thousand kilo per hectare. But, uh, but that's not what is now standardly found in practice yet. That is there to be to come. Some cultivation aspects. I think it's very important that people learn a little bit about quinoa before I go into the salt uh, tolerance. Sowing rates are 10 to 15 kilos. The crop cycle length is variable because uh, varieties can be different in their day length sensitivity. Um, but it can vary between 90 and 200 days, depending on variety and conditions, which also means that you can always find a variety that is adapted to a certain opportunity in the crop cycle length. 500 millimeter of water should be sufficient for this five tons per hectare, but yields are still very nice and, and two to three tons per hectare when you only have 300 millimeter of rainfall or water available. But, uh, there is a nitrogen yield, yield uh, need uh, because, of course, if you uh, have protein in your brain, then you remove nitrogen and it's about 50 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per ton of grain. And that is also something to fine tune. 
Um, you can uh, do row sowing. Uh, some people are even planting, uh, but usually we, we use uh, sowing uh, with, with 15 to 55 centimeter row distances. Uh, weeding is very important. We don't use any herbicides in Europe. In Chile, herbicides are possible. That's of also one of the reasons why they have these enormously high yields. Flowering starts one to two months after sowing. Uh, you can do com ha combine harvesting. You can also say if you, you have dry periods and you want to harvest uh, early, then you can do swatting. That means cutting the stems and putting everything back on the stems and letting it dry on the land and then take it up and do threshing in a separate uh, cycle. Standard combined harvesting threshers can uh, get almost clean seed, but uh, a little bit of further seed cleaning is uh, necessary that, that uses very standard methods like you would use in other seed crops. But, uh, some economic figures. Today, the demand is not yet enormously high if you compare it to rice or wheat or whatever, uh, but there is a strong increase in demand. And currently, uh, the production and consumption is about 250,000 tons. Farmers' price in the EU are 70 to 90 euro cents per kilo. Wheat is less, but also uh, the value of quinoa is much higher than wheat. So with this kind of price, farmers are really uh, persuaded to grow quinoa. For, let's say, re uh, the, the wholesale uh, trade my market prices are about one and a half to three euro per kilo. That's still quite high, higher than the current global rice price, which is, I believe, 60 cents, which is also extremely high for rice. And this, of course, is one of the things that that uh, needs uh, some improvement uh, it, at, at this kind of price levels. And uh, uh, so therefore, going for even higher productive quinoa is is important but it's also uh, possible. And certainly when we look at salt affected areas where no other crops are possible, quinoa can give additional yield that is, and food production. Uh, and it might be that then uh, the, the, the farming costs might also be lower because land costs are lower. But, uh, so cost price and salinity affected areas will be lower because alternative crops are not possible. Now, then a little bit about how the plant looks and, and what we do in breeding. Uh, you see uh, a head of, uh, of quinoa here, a close up of a colored one. And each of these little flowers, this is a little flower, uh, produces one seed. So in breeding, it means that uh, crossing is not that easy because it's very difficult to remove all the male function from all these flowers. So that's also a reason why normally varieties are inbred lines. So selfing is easy, 90% selfing, crossing is possible. But, uh, we know the genome sequence. Uh, we published that uh, uh, together with Jan Jarvis and a lot of other people in nature. So that helps a lot in the uh, uh, genomic uh, and, and uh, yeah, the genetic tool development. And what is now important today is that we have F1 hybrids. So we now have female lines, so they lack these yellow parts which are the enters that produce the, the pollen that, that's the male function so we have all female flowers and then we can use another line as male uh, line to fertilize uh, the uh, female ovule that's residing here and with that we can get fully pure f1 hybrids and we now have seen that those hybrids are uh, having uh, they're more robust uh, have really higher yield and that is going to be a future for uh, quinoa, we think. Now here you see a field trial. You see it can have different colors and uh, different maturity times, different heights. So there's a lot of variation also uh, in, in quinoa. Here you see an example of a salt trial. So I think now we come a little bit more to uh, uh, the salinity uh, tolerance. Here you see a series going from no salt to 300 millimolars of NaCl, which is 30 ds per meter. So that's way above 50% seawater. Uh, most crops would already die at this 10 ds per meter. So what we see here is a sequence of one variety. This is zero. This is 100 millimolar of, of uh, salt. And then we go to 200 and 300. So we see growth is less at 300 millimolar. 
but we still see that the plant is not uh, looking bad. It's uh, really healthy. It doesn't show any yellowing. It even has a, a head. And we see that at 10 ds per meter, the plants, and this is one variety, that's another, they really look almost the same still. And the yield levels are also similar. So that is why I think there's an enormous potential for using this crop in salinity affected areas. Here you see uh, calculated grain yields from uh, from a trial, and there is wide difference uh, between varieties in the level. There's one good variety here, Rio Bamba, that already that is uh, almost at three tons per hectare here. You see there is a decline when you go to 100 millimolar in yield, uh, but it's a very acceptable decline. It's still above two tons per hectare with the good variety. If you would compare that with barley, which is also quite salt tolerant, then you see barley uh, drops much, relatively much more than uh, quinoa. You can also see that here, where we have put it as a sort of stress index. That's the relative grain yield, where we put everything at zero at 100. And you see all the varieties here uh, have a decline, but we still have 70, 80 percent of the yield at uh, 100 millimolar NACL, which is 10 ds per meter. And barley there is also not bad. It still has 40. 5% of the production with no salt, but it drops much faster and uh, is, is really not as good in, in tolerating salt saline conditions as quinoa. Water use is also different, and that's uh, also showing a little bit uh, how much water you need to get it going. Uh, here you see uh, that uh, crop without uh, any salinity uh, needs about uh, 300 350 millimeters of uh, water, or you has an evapotranspiration of about 300 millimeters of water uh, to get uh, this two and a half tons per hectare. And you see that if you go to 100 millimolar, uh, the yield drops uh, a little bit, but also the water use drops. To, uh, if you go to very high salinity levels, of course, because production levels are lower, you also see uh, lower uh, evapotranspiration. Uh, here you see the soil evaporation. Uh, so then at the 300 millimolars, you can see that crop evapotranspiration is not much higher than soil evaporation only. And also growth rates are very reduced at those very, very high salinity levels. <clears throat> I would also then recommend that this crop would be used in areas where the salinity is initial salinity in the soil might be high, so like five to ten ds, DS per meter. But we still need a little bit of rainfall because otherwise, because of this evaporation, evapotranspiration of the crop, the water would be lost from the soil and the EC of the soil, the salinity level would only increase. So you need replenishment of the crop water use, and that is if you would do that with partially uh, or with, with saline water, then you would get an accumulation of salt. So we have a need of some uh, rainfall in the area where the soil is saline, I think. But that's for discussion, maybe. Now going to the Mekong Delta. Uh, this is uh, this I borrowed from uh, Dr. Bika. Uh, she showed that uh, maybe uh, the, the earlier talk, but it's good to have to, to uh, repeat that. Here you see uh, a season. Uh, one year, and you see that uh, uh, we have, uh, let's first look at the salinity level here, that's this curve here. Uh, you see that it goes from very low, uh, and that is uh, this, this phase when the rainfall starts, you see that the salinity level drops to very low values, and that is the cropping season where rice is still possible. But then when rainfall stops and uh, water loss from the soil to soil evaporation, and uh, also when you would have a crop, crop evapotranspiration, uh, would decrease the amount of soil water, then you see that the salinity level really goes up to six and later even above eight gram per liter, uh, which is about 10 ds per meter. So this is actually the range of salinity levels where quinoa doesn't suffer yet. And then uh, this could be the end of the growing season for quinoa. So in this phase, you could grow quinoa and then it would be one of the best crops to grow in that season. And this season here, you might grow rice still. So in this two cropping system, it would be the idea that in the drier season, 
quinoa could replace other crops that now are becoming increasingly difficult to grow in these saline conditions. But, uh, so associated with the rainfall pattern, you see this pattern in salinity, and that makes it difficult to grow crops in this uh, season. And quinoa would, would have no problems at all with this kind of salinity level. But, uh, we are now testing this also with uh, Dr. Bika and Travin University. In January, we will start uh, uh, sowing and planting uh, quinoa in uh, in the Mekong Delta in Travin uh, uh, province to really uh, yeah, sort of uh, demonstrate that this is uh, feasible in this area. You can see uh, the area, uh, I think if I'm, this should be the Travin area, I believe. Uh, and uh, you see that if you look at today and 2050, the salinity will uh, get further into the land. So the problems are aggravating. And uh, these are areas where uh, rice production becomes increasingly problematic, which is shown here. Uh, so we are looking at this area here in the Travin area somewhere here. Uh, and you see and I, here that uh, there are areas where rice yield loss is between 80 and 100 percent or 30 and 80 percent the orange so that's a tremendous decrease in rice productivity and the challenges and the opportunity also to find other crops and i think that we should really try quinoa in these areas where rice production becomes almost infeasible now to show this in another way you see a range of crops um, from quinoa to rice. And of course, uh, maize, uh, soybean and rice have an advantage in the existing market because these products are known. But under salinity, uh, saline conditions, uh, they are really uh, not going to do uh, really well. And you see that we have other possibilities like cowpea or mustard greens that could also have some salt tolerance. Um, but quinoa really is the most strong crop in terms of salt tolerance. The negative is that uh, we have to look at how we uh, get adoption of this crop. There is a global uh, market for it, but that has a certain uh, level of demand. Uh, I think it would be interesting to look at how the diet of people that have a lot of rice in their diet can also be improved by replacing some rice with quinoa. And that, I think, would be the challenge for the future to see how we can get quinoa production at the price level at maybe this level of three tons per hectare in say, salinity affected areas uh, where cost price of quinoa would become uh, in the range of uh, current price prices even. They may, may be a little bit higher because the value, the nutritional value is higher, but it uh, needs then, of course, uh, uh, we, we need to see how consumers can uh, adopt this this product and, and put in their recipes and menu. And that is a, a, a challenge on its own, I think. There has been some uh, testing of uh, quinoa in Asia. And here you see a lot of trials in different countries. Uh, and here you see grain yields, uh, even up to 10 tons per hectare in, in uh, a location in China. Uh, I have never seen that myself, but uh, it, it, you see also that the other places are usually between somewhat below two to up to four, five tons per hectare. Uh, there's a Dutch variety even here, NL6, which also uh, performs at about above four tons per hectare. In Vietnam, in the, we have seen that uh, one variety of us, Atlas, and this variety that's here, two want. Uh, produce between two and two and a half, three tons per hectare in different areas in Vietnam. That is still under no salinity conditions, but we also know that uh, our varieties um, uh, until 10 ds per meter don't suffer very much in yield. So we can expect this type of level also under the rather high salinity levels of five to 10 ds per meter in uh, the Mekong Delta. <clears throat> um, as I said, uh, we are testing uh, uh, varieties in Vietnam. 
Atlas uh, and Two Want are good varieties uh, that have been tested in several years, several locations, and always come out as best. And one of the advantages of the uh, Dutch variety that we have made is that it is non-bitter. Quinoa has saponins in the outer layer of the seed, and most varieties have this. And this bitterness uh, requires that you have to remove the outer layer of the seed with a sort of purling method. And this debittering is technically totally feasible. It costs about 20% of the yield, so that's a waste. And you need investments in the desaponification machine. So we think that using non-bitter varieties that can be directly used uh, would be easier to introduce and easier to adopt. And we know uh, that's a single gene only um, that causes the non-bitter trait. Uh, and we have also found which gene that is. Uh, here you see uh, something coming out of the Nature publication that we made on the genome of quinoa. Quinoa has two uh, sort of ancestral uh, diploid parents. One uh, is uh, shown here. Uh, this is a, a descendant of that parent and that is still alive today. And this is another one. And what we see is uh, that, uh, sorry, here, this is one and that's the other. Here we see all the chromosomes of quinoa and we can assess which of the 18 chromosomes are in the A genome and which are in the B genome here. And we also see that we can link the A and B genomes to one another. So the B6 uh, links to the A14. So you can clearly see it's an allo tetraploid. We know the full sequence. Here you can see it also relates very much to BEAT. This is the BEAT genome here with chromosomes 1 to 9 here. And the chromosomes of quinoa align also in gene order almost fully with the BEAT genome. But, uh, that creates huge opportunities for speeding up breeding in this crop too. We also found the location here uh, with a sort of uh, uh, yeah, analyzing uh, segregating populations. We found that there's a position where the non-bitter gene uh, allele has 100% frequency. So this is how we found the location of our non-bitter trait. And we've also found which gene that is. It's a transcription factor that starts up the whole uh, uh, try to pin pathway in the outer layer of the seeds. If it's uh, non-functional, there will be no uh, try to pins, and so no, and that is no saponins. A saponin is a try to pin, so we get no saponins at all there, no bitterness, and no need for this further processing. So, now uh, we can grow food in uh, saline areas with quinoa then. We are starting up agronomy feasibility studies in the Mekong Delta with uh, Travin University. Uh, we expect that we get yields of two to three tons uh, per hectare at uh, areas where we have five to 10 DS per meter. And I think that will be a higher yield than with any other crop in such areas. And therefore, I think that quinoa can improve food security and income in saline areas. It could otherwise be that we have to or that people have to abandon such areas and uh, move further inland uh, and then we would be wasting agricultural land that might be productive in terms of food production. Uh, lots of things need to happen still. Uh, we have to show the actual yield levels there. We have to further improve yield and one of the options there is to start testing our commercial F1 hybrid seed uh, varieties to, which uh, have double the yield of Atlas. So that could be an enormous uh, improvement also. And I think we haven't seen the end of that yet. Uh, we have to create fully day length adapted varieties. Also for this area, we have to check which varieties are best adapted. And so that's in the field of plant breeding. But we also have to develop the value chain. Uh, we have to see whether local consumption is possible, uh, cost effectively. And we have to see whether maybe there might be a market for sales to the bigger cities in Vietnam, where today already quinoa is sold at quite high prices. But that could always be a niche market, maybe. We can look at the, whether export to world markets is possible. But I think that also uh, a very important aspect could be local consumption, improving the diet uh, and improving food security from land that otherwise would not produce food.
So these are my conclusions also. Uh, great potential. It's until now quite, yeah, uh, it's it's mostly driven by universities, research institutes, and, and also this small startup breeding company, Radical Crops. And I think that we have to see how we can scale up and help is needed, I think, to get to the next phase of the final validation and implementation in saline areas. The work we do with Travin University in the Mekong Delta is part of that, but it might even be bigger than the Mekong Delta. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, you very much, much for this uh, elaborate uh, presentation uh, and uh, with a lot of detail. I hear one echo. And how do we prevent that? Maybe I by could, switching off. I, I could switch off my microphone at the moment and wait until people start asking questions and then turn it on again. That's OK. Thank you so much for that. Um, let me first ask uh, um, Robert. You said that Dr. Bika would also wish to say something. Now your microphone is off. Of course. I don't know whether what what Dr. Bika wants to say something. Bika gave a presentation uh, okay. earlier. And uh, if Dr. Bika is in the audience, uh, of course, uh, I would give her the opportunity uh, to say something. OK. Um, so we can I ask. And see yeah, if is. Dr. Bika is here, let her please come in. OK, um, yeah. even if she comes, uh, if she would like to come in later, that's also fine. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I would like to uh, open the floor for questions. Um, uh, whom can I give the floor? I didn't see hands yet. I didn't see questions in the chat yet. I see a hand of Mariana. Mariana, please come in. OK, your, your microphone, Mariana. Does it change? Is it different? Yes, this is much better. OK, and so one question about uh, the crop residues that are left on the field. So as we are interested in farming systems and not only in one crop, so how does it fit into a mixed farming system? How does it fit into a circular system? So what is known about um, quality and quantity of crop residues after harvest? And then yeah. I would have also some uh, um, yeah, practical questions about the experiment. Are you then using brackish water for irrigation on station and are you also using brackish water on farm so that that would be perhaps yeah. a bit challenging but this is i'm really interested now so thanks i i understand the questions uh, so let's first talk about the residues um, the residues even offer an opportunity to uh, remove salt from the system and we have to see whether that is an interesting uh, opportunity but uh, the salinity, let's say the, uh, the, the, the ash level, uh, the mineral level in, in the residue can be extremely high because the plant uh, can tolerate sodium and chloride in the plant. We have seen, even found values up to one molar uh, mole per, per liter in the, in the, in the, in the fresh uh, plant. And that's extremely high. So you could have something like 50 to 200 kilos of salt in the residual biomass and you could then remove that from the system and i think that could be very valuable of course you want organic matter in the soil but that's another aspect so that has to be balanced i think uh, in the grain you will not remove a lot of salt happily because otherwise it would be inedible i think uh, or not healthy so we've seen that it doesn't accumulate in the grain but it accumulates in the residue uh, in terms of uh, crop rotation, I think that uh, uh, other crops grown uh, uh, are not so uh, related uh, botanically that you might expect the same sort of diseases to happen. So I think in that respect, uh, crop rotation should not be uh, an issue. That was your first question, I think. 
The second question was related to uh, how we supply water. One of the things is that we get rainfall in uh, December still. Uh, so we can do a lot of production already on the amount of water that's in the soil. And we have to see how much water that uh, proves to be. Yeah? And then uh, 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 we could uh, consider uh, also seeing whether there's a benefit to using uh, canal water that is uh, maybe uh, at the level of uh, three to four gram per liter. I think that that would be values that you could see in canal water in this area. For quinoa, that would not be a problem to apply that. Uh, but of course, then we have to look at the system to see whether adding that kind of salt to the soil is, is really uh, uh, wanted and whether maybe the rainfall that follows after the quinoa season might even be sufficient to leach out some of the salt because what you see is here that salt levels are going down also uh, later again so there might be opportunities for using brackish water for irrigation um, and we were thinking about using land that has some salinity level uh, but we're still uh, finalizing the setups of the experiments so we can certainly include uh, a, level, a, a treatment factor where we have no irrigation with canal water and we have irrigation with uh, saline canal water i think that that would be a possibility Thank you very much, Robert, for answering this question. Meanwhile, Mariana already got a new question for you ready in the chat, but I'll keep that pending a bit. Uh, and okay. first move to Ole, who had his hand up before that. Ole, please come in with your question. Thank you. Yes, I have actually two questions, I think, but towards the same topic, and that is probably the biggest barrier, um, and that's the market. Um, and so my question is, what, what is the current, is, is there any current production uh, of quinoa in Vietnam? And is there any market? How is it sold currently, if, if ever? Uh, yeah. You showed, I think, a graph uh, with different aspects, and one was the market uh, that, yeah. that was shown in red. So uh, it, 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 maybe, you know, that's yeah. the, the, that was red. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but uh, okay. Consider your question. There is import of quinoa from uh, other producing countries in quinoa. So uh, in Hanoi, you can find it in the supermarket. It's uh, sold at uh, something like eight euro per five hundred grams. Yeah, so that is really for probably sort of expat market or very rich people. Uh, uh, but it's being sold. Uh, you see the white one, you see the tricolor one and whatever. So we found that uh, in Hanoi also. Uh, and Ho Chi Minh City, that will be the same. Uh, and uh, so there is some consumption, but also we know that if it would be a good food and it can be used easily in, in replacing some elements in menus, then adoption can uh, uh, it does not have to be a bottleneck. Um, I, I got this question also when we had this Securing Water for Food grant to start up uh, this quinoa uh, uh, pilot thing in Vietnam. They asked, do you have examples of new crops being uh, accepted? And there are examples, and soybean in Africa is one, I think. Uh, and what I read then is what that in the 1970s it was tried and it totally failed because it was only focusing at uh, agronomic feasibility. Uh, but indeed, the market and the, and the consumer adoption was forgotten about. But there were two countries where it uh, was successful and it proved that they were providing recipes to consumers. And they had products that uh, where soybean was used in sauces, where otherwise an other bean was used. And there soybean was taken up because it was a good productivity and a better better cost price than other, other legumes in the system. So then in the 1980s, I believe that it was restarted and then also taking into account consumer adoption and providing recipes where traditional products could be uh, replaced by soybean. And then it became a big success. And I think soybean is a big success today in Africa. So I think that we need indeed something where we show how 
you could use quinoa in dishes that and it can really easily replace rice in a dish because it has not exactly the same texture but it it uh, it really performs in the same way in a dish you could say and then providing mm -hmm. better protein that's, uh, that's exactly, you, that's uh, exactly my, my second question that I wanted to ask, because I know that quinoa is available in Vietnam. I, I uh, bought it regularly. I think it's rather towards four to five euros per per 500 grams. But, but uh, you, know, that, you know, we did this test with this Nofric course where people were sent to supermarkets and they found these things and then these, this price came up. I was also a little bit surprised about this super high price because it should really be easy to get cheaper. Yeah, I agree. So my, my question actually is, you say it can re easily replace rice. And I, I used it exactly in that way to replace rice and but purely for, for health reasons. Um, and even I have to, had to say that, yes, you can do it, but it's not the same food it's experience. Same. It's yep. not the same. It's, it's not the same food experience. Same. I, I'm not someone who is like a particular rice lover. So I, I'm wondering how people who are used to eating more rice and love rice much more than me, how that would translate into really the finding that it's easily can easily replace. Yep. I, I, I can give an example. We had this course uh, and we had all these people from Vietnam uh, in the course and we did a cooking test and we, we, we made uh, several uh, different things. And what was like best was just the plain rice, uh, the, the plain quinoa cooked without any addition of, of salt or uh, flavors or whatever. The, and that was very much liked. And um, now, of course, rice in Asia is often a little bit sticky, so it's a little bit more easy to eat with chopsticks. Uh, and eating quinoa with chopsticks is a little bit of a challenge if you wouldn't put the sauce through it or so. Uh, but we know also that quinoa comes in more sticky variants even. So there is, a, even in, in Canada, there were varieties that uh, were used in salads, for example, as, as cooked cold. Huh? And that didn't work well because that, that quinoa was too sticky. And the varieties we have produced for Europe don't have that stickiness. That has to do with amylose, amylopectina ratios. Uh, it's a very easy thing, like every time. Yeah? And it could easily also be seen whether we should make uh, more sticky quinoa. That would even more, look more like a, a rice type. But this is exactly something that should be taken into account. Also, rice, uh, quinoa as an ingredient, maybe, where, where you do a little bit of milling. Uh, and and uh, uh, so we need to do something. It's not equivalent to rice, but I think you can replace some rice in the diet. That, uh, I also okay. made an example fully fully vegetarian quinoa burgers, uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, it, it, it's really, really very tasty. And so you, you have to do something here in providing the way to use it in your diet, I think. I think, uh, Robert, we, we, we got a very good uh, ambassador for quinoa here, uh, having uh, the, this explanation. Uh, however, it also shows that for a crop to be a success, we also need the link to other researchers. For instance, the researchers who do research on consumer behavior and on why farmers change from one crop to the other. So I can imagine that you would really wish to link to other researchers, possibly on this call, who are doing that kind of research so that with all the breeding work you do on quinoa, they can do uh, work on how to um, explore with consumers how it fits in their consumption pattern and also how it fits in the farming patterns. And that is yeah. in a way uh, linking also uh, to the question that Mariana put about the uh, palatability of the residue for livestock and yeah. whether there is uh, literature available on that. Are you aware of any literature available on that? Uh, uh, yes, uh, we we have tested uh, quinoa as uh, a silage quinoa in the past, uh, a little bit like it's done with maize. Uh, 
uh, uh, a little bit differently than just getting mature grain and then have a residue. We used uh, the whole crop. It was a whole crop silage of quinoa. Uh, and it proved to be uh, very palatable uh, by, uh, by dairy. Uh, and we know a little bit the equivalence of a kilo of quinoa silage compared to uh, grass silage, for example. The <clears throat> and uh, so it is possible. Uh, well, we have to look into how easily it would be to uh, have a, a mature grain crop and then use the more lignified stems in, uh, in cattle feeding. I think depending on the productivity level of these these uh, of this of, of, of cattle uh, it might be possible to play a role if, if you look at uh, animals for traction I think that the uh, straw would be pal palatable for uh, animals if you would want to okay. have high, high it, it, it might yeah from your answer I'm getting that it might be an interesting option for future research where you do research on the quinoa that it might be interesting to, at the same time, search the research on the palatability for the residue yeah. for the livestock. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to... We, uh, to... we also have to take into account that if we do it on saline land, uh, that, that it might be too saline uh, stuff for animals. So we have to be careful. Huh? The... Of course, no, of course. But that's exactly, that's exactly the importance of such research where yeah. the livestock people should be involved. Because if we think that uh, the, the, the rice straw, and that in, in many cases rice straw is used as fodder, so yeah. if a farmer would replace it, it might be that there, uh, it's important that it could be a fodder yeah. crop. And then yeah. if the quinoa is so useful because it can grow under saline conditions, but if the residue uh, if the salinity accumulates in the residue, then we need to also do the research on that. Okay, I go back to uh, Ole for the question. He has a question. Yes, thanks. And that's regarding the salinity tolerance. Um, so you showed that at, I think, high salinity concentrations, the plant would not die necessarily, but stop growing. And yeah. if then... Very it's My question is, if, high, if yeah? after that high salinity, if you apply fresh water again, will it start growing again and produce uh, seeds? That would, it, it still produces seed uh, at this uh, high salinity level. So uh, it, whether it, it starts uh, producing a big plant and a big head again after uh, getting fresh water will depend on the stage at which you apply it. As if, if it would still be, uh, let's say, budding stage, yeah, and then you would have uh, rainfall and a re reduction or whatever, uh, irrigation and reduction of the salinity, then it would uh, still have some sort of uh, recovery potential. But if it's already flowering and grain filling, yeah, then the whole architecture is set in stone, I think. But, uh, the most important thing is if you start with a low salinity level and it would build up during the season, then you might just be in time and then you would have, might have this high salinity in the final uh, physical maturation stage, for example, where or the final stage of grain filling, which can still then be finished. So you will still have the product, while otherwise maybe uh, if it happens during grain filling, the plant would just wilt and uh, have no yield at all. This plant will not wilt under these conditions, so it can finish its, its uh, production cycle fully. Yeah. Thank you very much and, for that. I think uh, I think that 10 DSP meter is already extremely high. I, I don't know what you think about that. So at that level, it still grows f almost to the same architecture. Yeah. Sorry for interrupting you, Robert, but uh, I, I think that uh, you, with your level of knowledge, you could at least kind of tell us for another one more hour about quinoa. Uh, however, I need to kind of finish off almost because uh, we said we will keep you for one hour as an audience. Uh, and I do like to stick to that. I want to point out the important remarks that Mariana made in yep. the chat uh, that Maybe we should not consider quinoa as a replacer for rice, but 
explore how it could be used for new products and then it could be uh, uh, other um, uh, other dishes could come out of that and then uh, that still could catch the liking of the consumer and also uh, we need to think about uh, the importance of quinoa as a dry season crop uh, in relation to water use also that we do not um, kind of go for more groundwater use in those situations where groundwater use is already overstressed. Um, one point that was not covered yet was about the where quinoa is studied in the CGIR system. Uh, Ola, can you uh, in a very brief two seconds answer where it is? I don't think it's uh, particularly part of any uh, CG institute. There may be some research in the more in the non-focused institutes like IITA, uh, but I think it's really one of those under-researched crops. Generally. Okay, so we found an orphan crop, uh, and maybe uh, Iri, uh, in its work on the one CGIR, can uh, adopt this orphan because it's so close to rice. But let's see what happens with that. Oh. So that also makes that it's urgent to see how we uh, anchor the research uh, in uh, at the world scale because of course we are very uh, happy and proud uh, of the research that is done from Wageningen uh, with other partners all over the world uh, however it's important to link that also to other uh, research being done everywhere so if there are questions from the CGIR side on this point uh, please let us know uh, let Robert know, or, or if you let us know, we will guide you to Robert, uh, and then we can see how we can anchor this better. Um, having said that, uh, I like to come at the end of this session, thanking very much to Robert, but also the other people in his team, Dr. Bika, and also the others. Um, uh, we, we found it all very interesting. I also like to thank the team from uh, Asia Mega Delta's who uh, always does uh, the kind of background work, putting the, the announcement ready, getting uh, uh, the broadcasting uh, organized, very much appreciated. Not only this year, but we also look forward to the next year. Uh, we haven't set a date yet, but I think following the line of the third Wednesday, it will be 17th of January. Uh, and uh, looking at Ola, I think that uh, we will sit uh, uh, sometime soon, maybe around 8 January or so, <laughs> for setting um, what could be uh, the topic for 17. I leave it to you to select one. Uh, from Wageningen's side, we also like to table, for instance, the, the livestock topic, but also the food safety topic. We have other researchers working on those, and we like uh, in this new year, we are very happy to continue the Delta talks over. Um, uh, the, the year end break, but please all enjoy your year end uh, and looking forward to see you again next year. Ola, would you like to close off? Uh, you you mentioned everything. We're also from the Asian Mega Delta side. We're looking very much forward to continuing these webinar series. I'm, I'm sure we'll find plenty of interesting topics also for next year. Um, we can coordinate on that early January and then uh, second half of January we'll have the next version uh, of the Delta Talks. Happy holidays also from my side. Bye. And bye thank bye. you all for being my audience and uh, looking at the, uh, listening to my uh, talk. But uh, also thank you very much for all these uh, stimulating questions and suggestions uh, for further work.